Right, Pete, let's start with the inner solar system and Mercury. It's really quite poorly placed for most of this month. So. That's right. It's in the morning sky, and in the morning sky, the ecliptic is quite low to the horizon at around the sunrise time, so Mercury isn't very high up at all. But Venus, of course... Dominating it, the Well, it's in the other sky. part of the night, isn't it? Right just after sunset, you've got Venus bright in the twilight sky. And it's quite stunning, it has to be said. It, you'll miss it when it's gone. I always find this when Venus is in the evening sky and dominates the evening sky. When it's gone, you sort of miss it. And... Well, surely it's going to be there forever, but of course it isn't because it's it's May, actually, it disappears. So we've That's got right. it for another couple of months. That's, That's right. right. And a telescope will show you uh, some nice details on it, particularly now the planet will look like a, a crescent if you if you look at it through a small it's telescope. It's my favourite time with Venus, actually, because that crescent is really quite impressive. It's just, I mean, it gets thinner and thinner much quicker than you would expect because, of course, the planet's moving on a part of its orbit getting closer to the Earth. So you sort of take it for granted, don't you, in the earlier earlier part of its appearance in the evening sky because you look at it through a telescope and you see it as a, a sort of gibbous yes. planet yeah. and you think, oh, that's not changing very quickly. And then suddenly... After dichotomy, when it gets after the half phase, it really goes quite quickly. Yeah, so the, the advice there is get outside every clear night you've got. And to... make the most of Venus whilst we have it in our evening skies. We should point out as well that um, at the beginning of the month, there's rather a nice um, conjunction between Venus and the Pleiades because Venus will pass across the face of the Pleiades, which is quite unusual. So that's been quite a nice thing, to, quite a nice photo opportunity. And it will make the cluster look quite quite strange because you'll have this brilliant object in what is normally quite a quite a dim cluster. Yeah. It's not got lots of bright stars in it. So that'd be quite a nice photo opportunity. And we should also mention the fact that as Venus comes closer to us, so its apparent diameter is increasing. So at the start of the month. Um, it's about 25 arc 25 seconds. 25 arc yeah. seconds, but by the end of the month, it's much larger. It's about 38 arc seconds at the end of the month, so that's, that's quite a good size. It is, and there comes a point, I do wonder whether you can see the thin crescent with the naked eye. Well, we have tried this in the past, but the, the resolving power of the human eye is about one arc minute, Yeah. and Venus gets almost up to one arc, well, it gets about one arc minute, so it's right on the threshold. But the big problem with Venus is that it's such an intensely bright dot yeah. that when you look at it, if you've got any defects in your eyes, as if, but you have, <laughs> um, your, your eyes aren't perfect, then that bright dot doesn't look absolutely crisp. It always has something around it. Yeah. I've heard people say, oh, why does it have that shape? Or there's, there seems to be a second thing next to it all the time. And that's because it's a really testing thing for your eye to look at. Yeah, so it's probably quite a challenge, uh, probably quite a difficult one, but who knows, maybe it can be glimpsed. Well, moving further out, we have Mars. So Mars is coming good. It's going to be a great object later in the year when it comes to opposition. Um, the last one for the UK wasn't great because it was very low down, but this will be good. But unfortunately, it is still low down at the moment. It's currently very low down on a par with Saturn. But it's, getting, it's not great because it's moving towards the east. It's moving quite rapidly. So basically, you are losing the any advantage with Mars because it's sort of sticking with the morning twilight. But what will eventually happen, of course, is that its direction in the sky will change. Yes. And because it's then getting higher in the sky, it's moving to a part of the ecliptic which is further north, it will rapidly get really good. And it will get really bright as well as we get into the, the latter or the, the, the three-quarter part of the year um, because then it will get so bright, it will actually be brighter than Jupiter. Yeah, and it will be quite... Because it's a re very red colour. To see something that colour, red, yeah. high in the sky that's really bright, it is quite noticeable. It so is. It's like a glowing ember. It, it is. Oh, yeah. we've engaged the poetry today. <laughs> yeah, it is going to be very good. Uh, but now you can use a telescope um, if you've got a uh, if you've got a horizon that's clear um, you could be able to pick it up with a telescope it's about five, five arc seconds across so which is pretty small visually it's quite small camera. but if you with a camera you can pick stuff up but if you've got actually the, the prominent uh, albedo feature the sud is major um, that, that covers quite a large part of the disc so yeah. you should be able to see that but yes yeah, Mars slowly gaining ground but still uh, very low down at the moment. Moving out further, Jupiter, of course. This is another low down planet that we 
have in the morning sky. Um, there's a nice photo opportunity on the 15th of April when you have a 47% lit waning crescent moon forming a nice isosceles triangle with Jupiter and Saturn. So that looked quite nice. Yeah, it's quite nice. That means you've got to get up early in the morning though, um, which actually it's surprising how few pictures you get of the morning planets compared to the moon getting close to Venus, for example. Yeah, my preference is to stay uh, stay awake and stay through the night rather than get up early. Which is something you can do at this time of year, of course, yeah. because the nights are getting shorter. That's right. But, That's um, one of the benefits of summer observing. There is a curiosity as well with Jupiter because um, it appears 45 arc minutes from Pluto on the morning of the 4th of April. That's going to be quite challenging, I have to say, um, but it is quite interesting. If you take a photograph with a wide field camera and if you can get a dark enough sky and go deep enough with it, you might be able to identify that tiny dot which is magnitude plus 14 Pluto. Now, Jupiter, <laughs> is what well, that works out at about 3.6 million times brighter than Pluto. <laughs> so it is a bit of a challenge to go for that one. Yeah, that's going to be quite difficult. Uh, moving out to Saturn, it's quite low down though, isn't it? It uh, is. Well, they're all together, aren't they? Saturn, Jupiter and Mars. They are. The they moment, are all so. sort of hanging around the southern skies at the moment. Uh, and Uranus and Neptune, not really visible No, it's this not month. the time for them. So, um, yeah, so we've got some interesting things coming up, actually, talking about how the planets are aligning with each other, because on the 1st of April, it's um, Mag plus 0.8 Mars, sitting one degree south of Saturn. Um, and that's quite an interesting thing to look at because Saturn has got a magnitude of plus 0.9, which is similar in brightness to Mars. So it gives a good opportunity to compare the colour of both those planets. Well, yes, Saturn's a sort of yellowish off-white colour and obviously Mars is going to be quite a strong orange colour. So, yeah, it is quite interesting to compare the two. Often, redder things look brighter. Uh, this is one of the problems with observing uh, when you're doing variable star observations with red giants. Uh, okay. they, they can be more striking. Okay. We should mm. also mention, of course, that um, we've got a full moon this month, as we have most months. <laughs> and this one occurs quite close to perigee position. So it's going to be slightly larger oh, and slightly so we're brighter. Going to cue all of the headlines about supermoons, I'm afraid. Yes, yeah. but if you compared it to the one last month, you wouldn't notice any difference no, at all. No. But, um, I've never had anyone say to me, was it me or was the full moon bigger last night I guess of perigee? It's, it, it's interesting. That's a very interesting observation because nobody really comes forward and says that unless something has said, the moon is going to be super bright tonight, and then suddenly everybody can see the moon as super bright. But if they're not given that information beforehand, nobody comes forward. Nobody comes forward, no. no. Quite interesting. And it's also um, interesting because the moon is, when it's in its early phase, going up to full, it's quite prominent in the sky at this time of year yeah, as well, yeah. so it stands out a bit more. OK, well, if, as we go towards the, um, the latter part of the month, we have the annual Lyrid meteor shower, which is reaching its peak on the evening of the 22nd of April. Now, that's actually, it's a, it's a reasonable shower. It's a reasonable shower. Um, it's got a ZHR of about 18 meteors per hour, which doesn't sound fantastic, but it has got a bit of a variable peak. Yes, it can be up to 90 meteors per hour. I have to, I have to be honest, I've never had much luck with the Lyrids. I have I observed them a few times, and they have been not too bad, but the conditions this year... They're pretty good. ...are oh. perfect, because the new moon is on the 23rd of April. So, um, if you're observing on the night of the 22nd, then at the new moon is on the 23rd of April at 0226 UT. So it's basically on that night. Right, so it will be completely out of the way, and it is a good thing to watch out for to see how many meteors we get, yeah. um, get, get this time round, and whether, of course, you need to clear sky, of course, and April, hopefully it's going to be a bit drier and conditions will prevail. <laughs> yeah, well, towards the end of the month as well, that's a, the time when Venus, um, which we've already mentioned, but that's on the 25th, it reaches its 30% phase. So this, that's really the point which I mark as the countdown to getting really, really thin. So yeah, yeah. that's when you need to look at that. And saying that, we've also got um, a conjunction of Venus and the Moon on the 26th. So um, it's a 12% lit 
crescent moon getting very close to that planet. That's a real pull for astrophotographers and actually anybody with a camera. So if you've got a smartphone, even that should stand out pretty well. Yeah, it's quite a nice, uh, quite a nice thing to see actually, a, a thin crescent moon and Venus nearby. It's quite a striking image. Okay, well, in terms of the stars then, we are now into the stars of spring. We sort of, we're losing Orion very rapidly now. And just before we do lose it, it's probably worth mentioning that um, Betelgeuse has not gone off. No, we're, we're recording this in February and Betelgeuse is still there. There was a flurry of excitement early in the, uh, early in the year. One of my colleagues said, oh, we've detected an interesting burst of, gamma, of uh, gravitational waves. Yes. Uh, from nearby to uh, the, the region that contains Betelgeuse. But there was no neutrinos, and no you neutrinos. always get a burst of neutrinos when you have a uh, supernova explosion. So. Well, it was interesting because we're, as we're coming through to the end of February, as we're recording this, the, um, the actual um, brightness is started to bottom out and started to increase again. Yeah. So it's actually, it's most likely due to something getting in the way, something like dust. Well, there was an image dust. taken recently. With the VLT. Yeah, yes, that the has a large telescope. Which, which had a, a dark zone, and it looks like dust. But that's not uncommon. That was exactly what I thought it would be. I didn't think this was a new... No one has ever explained why it dimming meant that it goes supernova. Absolutely right. So yeah, I, I, right. I, didn't, I didn't buy that, I'm afraid. Nonetheless, though, as you say, we are losing Orion now. It's uh, low down by the time... Uh, low down in the west by the time uh, sunset happens. But the spring stars, I, I quite like the constellations of Leo and Virgo. Do you? Yeah, I, okay. I think Leo in particular is quite... It's one of those constellations that does vaguely resemble what it's supposed to. And I think it's quite quite an interesting one. The sickle in particular, I like the qu the backward question mark. Yeah, well, okay, the, the sickle is that uh, main defining pattern in Leo. It does look like a backward question mark. And it's got Regulus, the brightest star in Leo, as the punctuation dot at the bottom. It's um, It does stand out pretty well. In fact, it stands out pretty well because the other shapes in the spring sky are pretty ill-defined, it has are. to be said. They are. They're quite difficult. So, um, okay, so we've got also a bright star which is visible in the April sky, which can be found by extending the saucepan or the plough's curving handle away from the pan or the blade, however you see it, and eventually you'll arrive at the brightest nighttime star in the northern half of the sky. Northern half of the sky. <laughs> well, you have to qualify that because Sirius, of course, is the brightest nighttime star of them all. Um, and that's in the southern half of the sky. But this star is Arcturus, or Alpha Butis. Yes. And, and it's an orange giant star. It's, uh, what, it's about 36.7 light years away from Earth. But it is really quite impressive. And again, it's an orange colored star, very noticeably it orange. It is noticeably orange. It is quite a, it's quite a nice star. I quite, quite like red giant stars. Um, and, and in fact, you can use it to find uh, another interesting star. If you keep the handle curve round from Arcturus, you'll come round to Spica, the white star in Virgo the Virgin. The colors really compare well there, don't they? They do. Uh, yeah. Spica is a pure white star, and it compares very well to the orange hue of Arcturus. Yeah, it does indeed. Okay, well, Spica, of course, is the brightest star in Virgo, and Virgo is the second largest constellation in the night sky, but it just lacks any real structure. It, it doesn't really look particularly dominant at all, does it? it no, it's got that... It's. It, some people describe it as looking like a Y, where you've got the bowl of Virgo, which is a large semicircular shape, which then comes down to Spica, so it produces a sort of Y-shaped pattern. Well, it but could look a bit like a radio telescope antenna. Well, I would so, say it looks like a satellite uplink It does, station, it does look more like that. Because the main body of Virgo looks a bit like a rectangle, doesn't it, which is the building, so, but it's not quite as... Uh, it's not a romantic view of that <laughs> constellation. Well, but it, what, what is of interest here is what's in the bowl of Virgo, and this is lots of galaxies, because yeah. we are springtime, our view is out of sight. We're looking away from the Milky Way and out into extra galactic space. And in here, you'll find just... It's the realm of the galaxies. The realm of it sounds like something out of Doctor Who, but um, yeah, there are some great ones in there. You've got um, well, you've got M eighty seven, which is a monster elliptical galaxy. galaxy. That's the one which um, the Event Horizon Telescope imaged the 
central supermassive black hole in 2019. Um, but you've also got uh, Markarian's chain, which is a lovely curving group of galaxies. That's very popular with astrophotographers. But if you take a telescope and you take your time, use a fairly low power, you can locate these sort of, they're, they're not, with a small telescope, they're not particularly impressive, but they look like fuzzy blobs, fuzzy smudges. They are obvious though, I mean, they are you, obvious. Can, you can tell that they're The really interesting thing to do with them is to actually take a chart, and it, it's overwhelming because there's so many galaxies there, but take the chart and try and work your way around using the galaxies to hop to other galaxies. Star hopping from galaxies, galaxy, galaxy hopping. hopping. Yeah. <laughs> uh, actually, I'm looking forward to trying this because I've just recently upgraded to a 12-inch telescope, so I'm looking they forward to They should stand out pretty well. Yeah, I, I'm lo looking forward to trying this and get it's some well drawings. It's well worth taking your time with, though, because it, you know, and the, the really interesting thing, I think, about the bowl of Virgo and the realm of galaxies is the sheer lack of stars to help you work your way around. <laughs> it's very difficult, isn't You've it? You've got Rho Virginis, <laughs> which is probably the only one which um, you can you can use effectively. There are fainter ones, obviously, but it is hard work. Okay, so the region north of the Bowl of Virgo is visually interesting because it contains the naked eye open cluster Malot 111, and it looks like a triangular smudge of oh, light. Like stars. It's quite big, though. It is quite big. Well, this cluster actually forms part of a well-known constellation. This is Coma Berenice or Queen Berenice's hair. And if you take some low power binocular, low power telescope or low, you know, pair of binoculars and sweep through, there's actually quite a number of faint stars that are, that are visible. Yeah, it's, it's very quite an rich. impressive sight. But um, there's also, there's a nice one actually there. I don't know if you've ever seen it. It's called 24 Come Berenices. I have never seen and it. And that's, no. that's a lovely, colourful double star. It's, it's sometimes called the Spring Albario because it sort of compares very well with that. Um, that sits, well, Albario sits at the foot of the Northern Cross, of course, in Cygnus. So that's a summer um, double. But uh, 24 Come is... Quite a nice one to hunt down and look for. The only problem with that is that there are so many stars in Malot 111, it's sometimes difficult to actually <laughs> identify where it is. So you have to do a bit of star hopping to get that as well. But, but uh, uh, nice one to, to cross off the list of things to have seen. Um, yeah. So that's a good one to, to, to finish on probably. Well, there's plenty to see in the April night skies. All we need is some clear skies. That would be nice. Thank Thanks. you very much, Paul. <laughs> Thanks, Pete.